I'm Amitha Sharma. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, the Mexican government says mission accomplished after recapturing the drug lord known as El Chapo. A look at the big cleanup after this week's El Nino storms and we'll see what all the rain means for the drought on the KPBS Drought Tracker. Also tonight, San Diego is having a kumbaya moment after setting a goal of using 100% renewable energy. But clean energy advocates don't think it will last. And could cows hold the secret to clean energy and cleaner air in California? KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. The fugitive Mexican drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman has been captured once again. Six months after he escaped from a maximum security prison in Mexico, KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero has the story. Just before dawn today, Mexico's Marines captured Guzman in his home state of Sinaloa in a beach town called Los Mochis. Several people were killed in a gun battle, but Guzman was detained alive. Mexico's president, Enrique Peña Nieto, announced the capture on his Twitter account earlier today. He tweeted in Spanish, mission accomplished, we have him. Peña Nieto gave a press conference saying the capture of Guzman shows the effectiveness of Mexican institutions. La detención de este día es sumamente importante. Today's detention is extremely important for the security institutions of the Mexican government. Today our institutions have demonstrated once again that the citizens can trust them. Guzman escaped from a maximum security prison in Mexico last July using a mile-long underground tunnel that led directly into his prison cell's bathroom. His escape was considered a national embarrassment as it was the second time he had escaped from a maximum security prison in Mexico. Guzman faces indictments in San Diego as well as several other U.S. district courts on smuggling and other charges. The U.S. has sought to extradite him in the past. A spokesman with the U.S. Department of Justice says the U.S. seeks extradition whenever defendants subject to U.S. charges are apprehended in another country. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. The rain has moved on, but the wet weather left behind a messy legacy. Del Mar officials say it could take up to a month to repair damage from a coastal bluff collapse. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson has more. The rain-soaked earth gave way under a busy stretch of road that runs near the ocean. The landslide happened on Camino del Mar beside Anderson Canyon. That's just a short drive north of Torrey Pine State Beach. Del Mar Public Works officials immediately shut down the road's southbound lanes. That slide occurred, you can't tell from here, but the point is there's basically a cave that's been eroded into the, uh, to the, uh, the, the hillside here, and it extends underneath the roadway. So. The first thing we did was obviously close the road, and that, that eliminated the chance that somebody would, a sinkhole would develop and we'd lose vehicles down the roadway. A concrete culvert is still firmly attached to the road's pavement, but it will have to be removed. There's no dirt under it. This is the area that's undermined, and like I said, there are three separate utilities back there, storm drain, uh, sewer, and telecommunications that have to be rerouted. Del Mar officials expect to be working here for several weeks. They have to rebuild the bluff, reattach the utilities, then make sure the road can handle heavy traffic. City officials say repairs could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. The California coast has been getting pounded by heavy surf. Some waves have been as high as 12 feet in Orange and San Diego counties, making for dangerous swimming conditions. KPBS weather reporter Stephanie Olmo gives us a look at what's ahead. Boy, it's been quite unsettled throughout much of this week. All across the Golden State, we saw heavy rain leading to major flood problems. Fortunately, today we caught a break from all the action, but unfortunately, that is short-lived. We do have our 
have our next system uh, pushing through the area late today into the day on Saturday. So another dose of some wet weather, even up further north. But for now, keeping things relatively quiet around uh, Southern California, San Diego, pretty quiet conditions, fair weather pattern, Alpine, also in Mount Laguna as well. Temperatures for tonight diving down to 33 degrees. Ramona clear to partly cloudy skies, and we will keep it uh, generally dry for tonight. San Diego, also Mount Laguna. Take a look at these chilly temperatures dropping back to 20. Two degrees in Mount Laguna, 33 in Alpine, also further up north into Ramona, but pretty quiet conditions. So, once again, quiet conditions remaining tonight. Even as we head into early Saturday, we do have a high surf advisory in place until tonight. I know that was a major problem, large swells impacting the coast, but good news the waves and also the winds gradually subsiding here through tonight. Unfortunately, wet weather returns as we head into the first half of the weekend. This is the setup here for the day on Saturday across the southwest region. We do have that storm system pushing inland. That's going to weaken when it does so. It's going to produce spotty rain all throughout the Golden State, even some spotty snow around the Sierra Nevada and also throughout much of the state of Nevada. Taking a look at your extended forecast for the coast, we're expecting pretty quiet conditions this weekend for the most part. Just still cannot rely a chance of a shower or two. Temperatures at around 60 degrees, so a couple degrees below the normal for this time of year, keeping things fairly dry here on Monday, beginning the new work week. Increase in temperatures as well. This weekend, as we take a little bit further inland, a cool day here on Saturday. Can't rely a chance of a straight shower or two throughout the morning hours for the second half of the weekend. Temperatures will be warming up to begin the new work week on Monday. Also looking at the possibility of a shower or two under partly sunny skies. We're taking a look at your five day outlook for the mountains. Well, we're looking at that chance of a snow shower, especially during the morning hours on Sunday. Temperatures will be at about 43 degrees, 46, quieting down as we head into the new work week on Monday. We're looking at a mix of sun and clouds. Last but not least, as we check out the extended forecast for the desert slopes, as we take a look here as we head throughout uh, much of the work week here, we're looking at pretty quiet conditions. But first, let's take it into the weekend. Coming in at 63 degrees on Saturday, turning cloudy, cool temperature, 61. One, even cooler as we head into the second half of the weekend. We're looking at some sunshine on Monday with cool temperatures at around 63 degrees, 64 for the day on Tuesday under quiet conditions. Stephanie Omo, KPBS News. While we got drenched by El Nino storms this week, the rest of California is still on track for relatively average rain and snowfall this season. Science reporter David Wagner has the latest update from the KPBS Drought Tracker. This week, San Diego County received a whopping 17% of its normal annual rainfall in just three days. But storms that drenched us here in Southern California didn't make a large impact up north. Statewide rain and snowfall have been fairly typical for this time of year. As of Friday morning, rain was at 47% of what normally accumulates by April 1st. The Sierra snowpack was at 46% of that April 1st normal. David Pierce is a climate researcher at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography who helps compile this data. So, well, in San Diego, we're now running ahead of the average year and the amount of water we've gotten so far. For the rest of California, it's really just about average so far. However, Pierce says average is still an improvement over recent years. And looking back to 1998, rain and snow were at similar levels at this time of year. But of course, that year went on to be one of the wettest El Ninos on record. David Wagner, KPBS News. A Sacramento man who came to the U.S. as an Iraqi refugee is accused of lying about fighting with terrorist groups in Syria. Meanwhile, another Iraqi refugee who had been communicating with the Sacramento man was also arrested. The second man is accused of trying to provide material support to ISIS. Authorities say there's no evidence that either man was planning attacks in the U.S. The arrests, however, are renewing debate over whether the U.S. should admit refugees from Syria. Show me the money. Tax experts sounding off on Governor Jerry Brown's proposed budget for the next fiscal year. A state tax association is applauding Brown's financial prudence, citing his commitment to the rainy day fund and to limiting spending. But they are worried about a proposed hefty tax on managed care organizations and taxes to benefit California streets and highways. It's the largest uh, budget in California history. Uh, if you include all the funds, it's well over $170 billion. That's a lot of money, and I think it's reflective of the fact that Californians are producing enough revenue and we don't need higher taxes. 
The budget plan includes a $10.5 billion increase for the State Department of Corrections, with some of the money devoted to renovating prisons. Some advocates for the poor say they're disappointed by that part of the budget. So this is once again um, neglecting low-income communities with social services and social programs and instead just reinforcing penal interventions um, and expanding penal interventions with more funding for incarceration and, and policing. The governor's plan is part of an effort to address prison overcrowding. Advocacy groups are lining up behind a new initiative to get California's homeless a home. State lawmakers proposed a $2 billion project for the construction and rehabilitation of buildings for permanent supportive housing. Not many details of the project have been revealed, and neither lawmakers nor advocates are clear on exactly who will benefit most from the $2 billion bond. Are there any concerns with, with where the money actually is being uh, invested with this uh, proposal? So I'm actually not, uh, I'm not clear on that piece, so I don't want to speak to that. Yeah. California has the largest homeless population in the country with 114,000 individuals. Lawmakers have not specified when more details of the project will be available. This week's rains were bad in San Diego, so how did Tijuana fare? The idea of pensions for all city workers has risen from the dead. Now what? And SeaWorld finds itself swimming in lawsuits. Join us for the roundtable tonight at 8.30 here on KPBS. A top Marine official predicts there will be pressure to lower the bar in the military because that's the only way more women will be able to advance in combat jobs. General John Kelly, head of the U.S. Southern Command, says without lower standards, women could not move into jobs like the Marine infantry. Defense Department, of, Defense Department officials rather said requirements for combat posts won't be changed to admit women. The Oceanside City Council has voted to support proposed legislation to move spent nuclear fuel from San Onofre to an interim storage site. San Diego Congressman Daryl Issa is co-sponsor of the bill. It would transfer the nuclear waste to Texas temporarily since there is no permanent storage site available. State regulators have reached an agreement with Southern California Gas Company to try to burn off some of the natural gas leaking from a well near Los Angeles. The well's been leaking for months, driving some residents from their homes nearby. The burn-off could start next week. San Diego made national headlines last month when it became the largest city in the country to set a goal of using only renewable energy. But how to reach that goal remains an open question. KPBS reporter Clara Tregesser says political battles could be brewing over who controls the city's energy. Nicole Capritz walks through a parking lot in Claremont and stops to gaze at the structures overhead. They look like metal trees but with solar on top. The environmental activist points out so-called solar trees, which suspend solar panels over parking spaces. They collect electricity that runs into the adjacent offices of Kyocera, a solar panel manufacturer. The idea is that we want locally homegrown clean energy. We don't necessarily have to go out into open space miles away and ship energy into San Diego. We can build it right here and use it right here. And that's where we want the future to be. Generating solar power is just one rung on a ladder that will climb to 100% renewable energy by 2035. Or at least that's the goal laid out in Mayor Kevin Faulkner's climate action plan. Achieving it will mean dropping natural gas from 52% of the city's power supply to zero. Capritz now heads the environmental nonprofit Climate Action Campaign. She wrote the original version of the climate plan and was surprised the renewable energy goal survived. 100% is bold and you know, pushing the envelope as to what our city leaders are usually comfortable doing. Now is the time in stories like these where you might expect to hear from business groups opposing such an environmentally ambitious plan. But that isn't going to happen. The environment and the economy are not um, things that are at odds with each other. Sean Carafin is the executive director of policy and economic research at the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce. A thriving business environment uh, is one in which the quality of life is, is high uh, so that we can attract the best and brightest uh, talent 
uh, from around the nation, around the world. So everybody's on board, but how will the city actually reach its 100% renewable goal? Capert says answering that question may end the kumbaya moment. I do unfortunately believe that there are going to be, um, you know, tensions and uh, probably uh, battle lines drawn when the implementation of the plan moves forward and actual specific policy recommendations come to the fore that uh, people will kind of get back into their usual corners. The reason to enter the ring will likely be community choice aggregation. That's an alternative energy program that takes away purchasing power from San Diego Gas and Electric and gives it to the city. Capret says community choice is the only way to go 100 percent renewable. The problem is that we don't have any control or jurisdiction over our utility and so we can never bind them to deliver 100% clean energy to us. But she worries SDG&E will influence the Chamber of Commerce to oppose the program. I'm just hoping that the other small businesses and voices at the Chamber have equal weight and so we can have a fair conversation. Carafin with the Chamber says his organization isn't opposed to community choice or CCA for short. The business group isn't considering other options for reaching the clean energy goal at least for now. If we spend the next uh, year, two, three years uh, looking at community choice aggregation in every way and we decide that it is feasible, then excellent. If we decide that it's not feasible, then we shouldn't have to move forward with something that we've decided is infeasible. We should have the opportunity to look for another option that gets us to that same goal, which is 100 percent renewable energy. The Vermont city of Burlington recently became the first in the country to go 100 percent renewable. Mayor Miro Weinberger says his city has total control over the electric company. It's part of city government. I think it's really given Burlingtonians a much greater ability to see that their values and their environmental interests are reflected in, in their electrical utility. We don't have the same kind of responsibility to try to earn a return for investors as other types of utilities. San Diego's population is 33 times greater than Burlington's, so supplying renewable energy here will be a much bigger challenge. And nowhere in California has anyone taken that amount of the energy off of the local utilities load. So we're in uncharted waters when it comes to program size. Capert says within the next few years, she'll know whether the city is on track to reach its goal. If it isn't, the battle will begin, likely in the courtroom. We do have um, the threat, frankly, of people suing the city and, and saying, you have not met your legal obligation. And if we have to get the courts involved to tell the city, hey, uh, you're going to have to step up here and uh, meet these requirements, then that's what we're going to have to do. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. Forget wind turbines and solar panels, cows may hold the key to California achieving cleaner energy. Scientists say the methane gas produced by cows is harmful to the environment, but it can be repurposed to produce clean energy. Governor Brown has allocated $35 million to this project in its latest budget plan. Animal agriculture in California has already started to use this technology. In other countries, it's very popular, for example, Germany, but here people are now starting to do it too. California produces 20% of all dairy products in the U.S. The state has the highest concentration of dairy cows of any area in the country. I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next News Hour. Miles O'Brien on the latest in health technology at the Consumer Electronics Show. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. San Diego's Restaurant Week has become so popular, it's now held twice a year. KPBS culture reporter Angela Caron says a local group is hoping to create a similar buzz around San Diego's theater scene. The Performing Arts League is launching the first ever San Diego Theater Week. It will take place during the last week of February. Local theaters, both big and small, and some dance companies will offer discounts on tickets. Others will do extra programming after shows, like a Q&A with the cast. Organizers say this week-long event is meant to build awareness of San Diego's theater scene and the range of ticket prices. Angela Carone, KPBS News.
Working up a sweat at the Consumer Electronics Show, hot new gadgets help new and veteran fitness fans maximize their results for the new year. Associated Press reporter Haven Daly shows us how they track progress and offer f advice on fitness goals. It's easier than ever to stay healthy at the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. Yeah, you can't get better if you're not measuring what you do. And all this technology just makes it easier to measure what you do and become a better athlete. Whether it's your golf swing, baseball swing, or your jump shot, new tracking equipment embedded in sports equipment aims to improve technique and document progress. Once again, dozens of new fitness bands are on display but counting steps is no longer enough. New wearables can actually detect what kind of exercise you're doing and offer advice. Smart track automatic exercise recognition that tracks your workouts automatically and logs them directly in the app. And things like FitStar on-screen workouts that show you guided workouts directly on your wrist. Other activity trackers have moved from your wrist to your feet with several companies showing off smart shoes, which can help correct poor form and posture. All that running doesn't have to be boring. Several companies are showing off exercise equipment you can use while playing video games or while you work, thanks to these office treadmills and bikes. Working at home can even be relaxing with this new half sauna. You can sit in the sauna, it produces that same healthy sweat. It's a dry sauna, so there's no water. And with all the different workout gadgets, plenty of action cameras to show off all your newfound athletic ability. Haven Daily, Associated Press, Las Vegas. Two more automakers are jumping into the race to build self-driving cars. The Renault-Nissan Alliance plans to introduce 10 different models. They'll be phased in gradually in the U.S., Europe, Japan and China, with the first batch debuting later this year. Average American spends 750 hours a year into the car. So these are 750 hours doing nothing except driving. If you can take back part of this time to do something else, it's a huge uh, advantage. About half a dozen other companies are also working to give drivers that advantage. California has already rolled out its first rules for the cars, including the requirement that a licensed driver must be in the driver's seat. And one more bit of technology intended to make our lives easier. It's called the MadeBot. Sasha and Simons of Innovation Trail gives us a look. You're the best, Rosie. You betcha, Mr. J. You can call it a modern-day Rosie the Robot. Rosie is awesome but ugly. So the one thing that I think is beautiful is if you've ever seen the movie Wally, -E, uh, Eva, that, that robot. Futuristic, minimal, and sleek. If 19-year-old entrepreneur Micah Green gets his way, a new housekeeping robot he created will be on the market by 2017. MadeBot is still in prototype stage, and once complete, Green says it will help take the hotel industry by storm. It's been the same for like over a hundred years. Like they've been doing, the biggest innovation in housekeeping has been the electric vacuum, which came out in 1905. MadeBot will assist hotel housekeeping staff to clean the floors, and it will eventually make beds and help maintain the bathrooms. The team of eight from Ithaca, New York, says the lightweight machine will do more than just save time. It'll save someone's neck. Literally. Robotics in general focuses on dull, dirty, or dangerous tasks. So uh, housekeeping encompasses all of those. Studies show that maids and housekeepers have one of the highest injury rates in the hotel industry and in the entire private sector. Coming in at around 40 percent, back injuries are the most commonly reported, followed by pains in the hand and wrist and shoulder. A lot of injuries aren't reported, and especially among this kind of, this kind of uh, workforce because they're part-time workers, sometimes they're contract workers, uh, and they, you know, they're probably they're at, at risk of losing their jobs. Grant Essler lectures about OSHA guidelines at Rochester Institute of Technology. He says ergonomic injuries are more subject to underreporting simply because they're not as obvious. Musculoskeletal injuries are, are difficult to identify as work-related. I mean, you know, it could happen you know, when you're playing softball or picking up your kid at home. I find this fascinating, but how is this going to be able to clean my floor and make my bed? 
So this is the first step in that direction. Um, but this guy is going to focus on the floors. And uh, essentially what we're doing here is we're creating uh, the, the robotic vacuum where the impeller will be in the center and then we'll have the intake. Maybot's omnidirectional wheels roll forward like normal wheels but can slide sideways and won't skid when it turns. David Moraniti is in charge of the technology. This is the transmitter the team is using to test the product. Now for traditional aircraft, when you use this, this throttle stick, you want to hold in a certain position. So if I want to go forward at a certain rate, I can leave it there. Maybot will make its rounds to a few hotels this spring, so staff can check it out. More than anything, the startup's boss says he wants his invention to make a real difference in people's lives. We're not trying to just sell robots, we're trying to sell time. And if you just imagine the time that we could save by creating a product that does it for you, completely autonomously, to me that's amazing. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us and have a good evening.